Hi everybody, it's Franny from Heidi and Franny's Garage and today I have something super special for you. So I want to thank and welcome all of our new friends from Brazil. So Marcela Tala, thank you so much for the shout out on your channel and uh, this, this is Lemon Drop and Lemon Drop is a 1969 Volkswagen Beetle Cabriolet. So we're going to run through pretty much just the yearly maintenance on this car. We're going to set the valves and do electrical stuff and we're going to drain the oils and stuff. It's going to be great fun. So thank you again and welcome all of our wonderful friends from Brazil. Tools and supplies we'll need for today. On the far right there is a 10 millimeter nut driver we'll use to get the nuts off the bottom of the drain pan. Then next to that is a torque wrench. Then next to that is a 17 millimeter hex we're going to use to get the drain plugs off of the transmission and the fill plug. To the left of that is our big ratchet and then a smaller ratchet next to that. Then you'll see our really fancy spark plug wrench with the built-in universal joint at the end. Then we've got our feeler gauges for doing the valves and our short stubby screwdriver. Below that are two wrenches, a 13 and a 14 millimeter that we'll also need for doing the valve clearances. And above all this is a wonderful book I highly recommend if you've got an air-cooled Volkswagen Beetle. It's John Murr's book on how to keep your Volkswagen alive. This is a great read, has tons of very useful information in it, um, and just an absolute classic for the air-cooled Beetles. To the left of that are our replacement valve cover gaskets. Below that are some electrical tune-up parts. We've got a new rotor cap, some points, and then our four spark plugs. To the left of all this is all of our oil stuff. So we've got oil drain pan gaskets, and then we've got new oil for the transmission, and then our oil for the engine itself, our trusty drain pan, and above the drain pan there is a large grease gun that we're going to use to hit some of the grease cirques under the car for the suspension. I'll run you through the steps we're going to do today. Now there's quite a bit that we're going to do on the car. It's going to make for a bit of a long video. So I'm going to put a table of contents up here and that'll allow you to jump ahead if you want to any point in the video. I'm also going to leave that down in the description below as well. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is set the valve clearance on the car. The number two is going to be to do the spark plugs. Number three is a bit of distributor maintenance. We're going to replace our rotor cap and clean our rotor and just do a visual inspection on the distributor itself. And then number four is broken up into a few pieces. So 4A is going to be the engine oil, 4B is going to be the transmission oil, and 4C is going to be cleaning this air cleaner. So this is an original oil bath air cleaner, so we have to clean the whole thing out because it's probably schmutzy. And then we're going to fill it back up with oil as well. And then number five is the timing. So we're going to do uh, a static time and a dynamic time on the car. And I'll run you through the reasons for that. Number six is going to be a carburetor tune. So we want to make sure our carburetor is working properly and gives us the best possible running. And then the last thing we're going to do is hit the small grease zerks up in the front torsion tubes. Now this car has a ball link suspension up front, so uh, the torsion tubes are the only thing that get greased up there. So our first step in setting the valves is to get the engine to top dead center cylinder number one. And we do that by popping the top off the distributor cap here. All right, pull this guy off. Now this distributor on this car is a double zero nine. So zero zero nine distributor, which means that it's a centrifugal advanced distributor. Uh, it might be a little bit different than what you'll see on your car. Of course, these things have been swapped out over the years, but there's a notch over here. So we're going to rotate the engine until our rotor cap lines up with that notch. Now remember, you want to put your, your parking brake on, chalk your wheels, and put the car in neutral because you won't be able to turn it if it's, if it's in gear. So we can turn the end of the generator. Now it should, the belt should be loose enough 
that we'll get to a compression stroke and it should spin or slip a little bit on the belt. And that's great. That means that the belt isn't too tight. You can always pull the belt together a little bit to get a little better traction. And there we go. See that the, we've come to a compression stroke and it's slipping. That means the belt is set properly on this car, which is great. So just pull them together. Continue to turn this a little bit. Now, as we come up, there are notches on this pulley. All right, the first notch corresponds to 10 degrees before top dead center, then seven and a half degrees, and then top dead center. With cylinder number one at top dead center, what we're going to do is we're going to pull the valve cover on the right side. So cylinders are numbered one, two, and three, and four. So it's, 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 it's funny, it's the same as the 356, which is great. At any rate, we're going to go ahead and do the first cylinder number one. Now the firing order on this car is one, four, three, two. So if we go backwards, we can do cylinder number one, then cylinder number two, and then cylinder number three, and then cylinder number four. I've got to think through this a little bit. But we just, we're going to rotate the engine backwards 180 degrees every time. And what that does for us is allows us to stay on one side of the car as we do two cylinders, and then the other side of the car. So we're not going back and forth. So that makes it really easy. Great. So we have top dead center for cylinder number one. We're going to go ahead now at this point, uh, go ahead and pop off the valve covers and start adjusting the valve. We'll start by putting a rag underneath the valve cover here because it's, it's definitely going to leak a little bit. So we'll just work this rag up here. Yeah. Underneath here. Next, we just pull the bail wire hoop off of the valve cover itself. Now, these valve covers are nice and they've been painted and everything. So I'm going to be careful to pull these off. I'm going to use the end of a small pair of needle nose pliers, actually, that's nice and uh, padded so we don't crack or break this paint. All right, we just work this down like this and this little notch here. All right, and now we can pull this guy down. There we go. We're going to just work our valve cover off. There it is. Roll it backwards. Catch any oil. We can inspect the valve cover and gasket and everything, determine if we actually even need to replace it. You know, if they're not leaking, you really don't need to replace them. Let's go ahead and look at these valves. Now, we have set top dead center for cylinder number one, which is way over here on the right. I'm going to grab hold of these. Yep, we should hear them. They should both be a little loose because both the intake and exhaust should be a little loose. We have our point, we have our point zero zero six feeler gauge and we're going to slip it on the top here behind the adjustments and see how it feels. This one actually feels really good. Now the exhausts are on the outside, intakes on the inside. It's a little tighter than the exhaust. Well, that feels okay, actually. I'd go with those. That feels pretty good to me, so I think cylinder number one is great. Next step is to rotate the engine counterclockwise to the left for 180 degrees, and then we'll be set for cylinder number two. Now, the pulley on this car doesn't have a notch at 180 degrees, so what we're going to do is we're just going to use a straight edge and, and put it across the pulley, and we're going to mark it with a little bit of nail polish at the, at the bottom so we know where our 180 degree mark is. All right, so all we do is throw our ruler on here. We have the car set to top dead center, cylinder number one. And we just need the mark on the exact opposite side. So we run the ruler through the center of our bolt, pulley bolt, right where that mark is. Just a little mark. That's all you need. All right, with our 180 degree mark there, we're going to rotate the engine counterclockwise or backwards. 
180 degrees to get it lined up for cylinder number two. Okay, here we go. We just rotate it backwards this way here until our little mark comes up. There it is. Okay. Great. Now we're all set to check the valve clearances on cylinder number two. All right. The intake feels really good. Nice and loose. Now the exhaust is a little tight. I mean, it's, it's okay, but it's a little tight. So let's go ahead and loosen that up just a tad. So we'll need our 13 millimeter uh, wrench. And all we do is we just loosen this guy up. There we go. Loosen it up just a bit. All right, and we're gonna use our screwdriver and loosen the clearance just a tad. All right, and now double check, see where we are. A little too loose though. And tighten it up just a smidgen. See what that feels like. A little bit more. And we could go just a smidgen more. And that's getting a little bit tight. This is a bit of an iterative process, back and forth. What you want to feel is a little bit of friction on both sides, from the tappet and also from the valve head itself. That feels pretty good to me. Okay, I like that. Just the right amount of resistance. Now the trick is going to be, we have to cinch down that 13 millimeter nut and the trick is to do it without moving the screw at the same time. So. All right, now we just want to check it and see where it is. One last check. Are we happy? Yep. All right, with that valve set, we're done on the right side of the car. So we're going to put the valve cover back on and then we're going to rotate the engine another 180 degrees counterclockwise and set up for cylinder number three on the left side of the car. So since these valve cover gaskets aren't leaking on the car, we checked it before we uh, pulled them off and they weren't leaking. So what we're gonna do is just kind of clean them off a bit, all right? And then we're gonna put a thin layer of grease over the gaskets and go ahead and reinstall them, all right? So we just wipe it down. So we're just putting a thin layer of grease here, right along here, all the way around. This will just help seal it a bit. we go so just like this all the way around all right with our valve cover all greased and ready to go we just have to put it back on the car we're just going to fit it back up and then pull the hoop up from the bottom and snap it in place all right you always want to wiggle it around a little bit make sure it's seated all the way use our nice padded wrench handle here so we don't scratch it and it'll go the last little bit and go snap. There we go. Okay, you want to make sure that your bailing wire is sitting in the notch that runs through the center of the valve cover. Okay, with that side done, we're going to go ahead and move to the left side of the car and repeat this entire process. With our engine still cold, we're gonna go ahead and swap out the spark plugs. Now I gapped all four of them and I found all four of them to be just on the teensiest bit of the tight side. So they're 0 0.025 to 28 is what they should be gapped at. So I went ahead and got them in within that range. Now, another thing is Porsche 
says that they've they would rather you didn't use anti-seize on your spark plugs. Now, I like to use this stuff. It makes it keeps the spark plugs from locking themselves into the heads really hard. So um, I'm going to go ahead and use it, but I use just the teeniest little bit on the threads of the spark plug. So you see me put some of that on there. And my spark plug wrench is kind of cool. It has a uh, universal joint built right into the back of it. So it's perfect for the three little 356 and also for the Beatles as well, these flat fours are a little hard to get back there. It doesn't matter where you start. I'm going to start in, in, uh, actually on number three back here. So the most forward one on the left side doesn't matter where you start. And I'm going to go ahead and feed, I'm going to pull the plug wire out, then I'm going to feed the socket in and make sure I've got it over it. Then I'm going to add my ratchet. I just find that easiest. Alright, so we pull our plug wire out. There we go. You also want to take a look at your wires and especially this little gasket that goes on the end of the uh, uh, plug wire here. This one is all bent and goofy looking. They're important that these things fit well over the hole in the tin down here, this hole. If they don't, then you've got air escaping and the engine isn't cooling as well as it could. I'll do what I can to bend this one back, but I think these are going to need to be replaced at some point. We fit our socket down over the plug. Try to get it in by hand, get it to sit in there, okay, and I guess, and then we fit our ratchet over the top one. Yeah, here it goes. All right, there we go, it's loose. Now looking at our first plug here, it looks great actually. It's exactly the color we'd expect it to be. It's a little bit brown around the edge, which is fine. And the center of it is nice and light brown. So that's, a, that's, a, that's exactly what we're looking for on the plug. I'm noticing there was no anti-seize on these plugs. That's one reason why they were a little bit difficult to get out. But they look great. We could actually just clean them and put them back in, but I've got a brand new set. so. These will go in my little bag that I'll keep in the car for known good parts. It does depend a little bit on the type of plug wires you have, but almost all beetle wires require you to remove this little bit off the top. So you can just grab it with a pair of pliers and unscrew these things. They really just screw on. Here we go. So just unscrew the little guy off the end, boom. So with the anti-seize, just the teeniest little bit is all we need. It's just really just a kiss on each, just a little bit on each side is fine. And that's about all you need. So no more than that, don't, you don't want to lather it up, just a little bit. And I find it easiest to go ahead and insert our plug into the socket first so we can feed it back in. Now it's kind of a strange, it doesn't go straight in, doesn't go straight down, it kind of goes in at an angle. So it's a little bit hard to kind of figure out exactly where it goes. But once you do one or two, you'll figure it out. All right, so we feed our spark plug back into our hole. It should definitely turn in by hand. I'm going to use my teeny weeny little ratchet here just to just to choke up on it a bit and make sure it's seated all the way. Now since these are brand new spark plugs, what I'm going to do is cinch them down, then I'm going to loosen them back up, and then they get torqued to 25 foot-pounds. Yeah, that's better. Then we go ahead and replace our spark plug wire, but once again, we want to make sure that our gasket seals well around that hole. There's the noise we're looking for. All the other cylinders are exactly the same, so I'm just going to go ahead and pull out all the, the other three plugs and replace them just like we did number three.
Okay, all spark plugs done. Since we still have our distributor cover off, maybe now is a good time to go ahead and swap out our distributor cap. Uh, I don't have a replacement rotor, but that's okay. We're just going to do a couple of things. We're going to go ahead and pull the rotor cap off and we're going to clean it really well. It's actually in really good shape. There's no wear at all on this really. So I've got a little bit of uh, electronics cleaner here and just a nice soft clean rag and I'll just rub that down on the top just like this and then catch the end of this thing as well. We just want these contacts to be clean. All right, that looks great. Also, in the top of the distributor here, there's a felt pad, and that felt pad should have oil in it. It's what you use to oil the top bearings on the distributor. So let's go ahead and put a little bit of oil on that as well, because it looks awfully dry. Now, I like to dig this little pad out of here to start with, all right? And I like to put a little oil inside here to start with. That's just, this is just motor oil, so it's just a teeny bit. Really don't need to put much in here at all. There we go, just a few drops is really all you need. Okay. And then, on top of that, our little pad goes back on. And it will sort of soak up the oil. Make sure you catch any that comes out. And then you can put a little bit on top of it as well. We just want this pad wet. So we can put maybe another drop or so, and that's all we need. With our felt pad lubricated and the top of the distributor lubricated and our rotor cap clean, we can go ahead and put our rotor cap back on. The rotor cap is a little hard to see, but it has a notch on the inside of it, and there's a notch on the edge here of the top of the distributor. So we just want to get them lined up, and we can rotate. Now we can't rotate. There we go. To install our new rotor cap, all we really need to do is find out where it indexes on top of the distributor. So with our old one off, we can throw the new one on and rotate it around until it sits properly, because it's not going to sit out 180 degrees. It's not going to sit anywhere but where it needs to sit. Boom. Okay, great. Now we can clip it on at this point. This is one last thing to fuss with. Now our old distributor cap is the same way. It has a wide tab here. It has a wide tab right here and a thin one there. The wide one goes over here. This is number one. When we rotated our distributor to do our valves, the rotor was pointed towards number one. This is cylinder number one. We can work this wire all the way back and verify, yep, that that's number one. So we pull this off of our old distributor cap. We'll start with number one. Now you want to be careful not to just yank these wires out. You really need to kind of move them around. I like to move them around a bit of a circle like that and then push them in till they seat all the way and then push this rubber cap back over the top. And then all we have to do is just go around in order, one after the other, doesn't matter which direction, just as long as you get them all in the right spot. Okay, our new rotor cap is on and our new wires all fitted. So what's next is to take, put the car down and take it out for a little tootle and get it warm because we're going to go ahead and drain the oil and the oil in the transmission. Well, we've taken the car out and warmed it up, so we're all ready to change our oil. Our first step is going to be to pull our oil filler cap here. All right. We always want to check our gasket in here. This is a quart gasket on this one. It looks like it's in good shape. So we're going to set this aside. Having this open will help the oil flow out of the car better, so that's why we're doing this. 
this is our drain pan on the bottom of the car. So we're gonna have to take all six of these nuts off and I can imagine it's gonna make a bit of a mess. I know that some cars have a single plug in the center that you can drain the oil out first. That would be awesome. But this car doesn't have that. So we're gonna loosen all of these up, then slide our drain pan over and then take them out the rest of the way. These are 10 millimeter. So just loose. They shouldn't be very tight. There we go. Yeah. Right. There we go. Okay, now they're loose. We can pull our drain pan over. And it's centered. And begin to remove these. There should be a copper washer under every one of these. Here's the start of the oil. And our last one. As we do this, quite a bit of oil is gonna come out. We want to do this one very slowly. Now this is certainly a bit of a mess. I think we'll let it drain like that for a bit because I'm afraid it's just going to make a ginormous mess if I pull that last nut out. We'll wait till it's drained a bit. There we go. That's better. It's also a bit hot. Okay, we got our last nut off. And here it goes. All right. There's our plate. Now above it is the little oil strainer that's on these cars. So there we go. We're going to pull that off carefully. There we go. So we're going to clean. Now there should be a paper gasket up here as well, so we'll pull this down. There we go. We'll let that drip a little bit. While that's dripping, I'll go ahead and take away the plate and the strainer here, and we're going to clean those and get them ready to put back up. With the oil still draining out of the engine, we're going to go ahead and prep our screen here with our new gaskets that we've got and so it's all ready to go back in. The paper gaskets that are on each side of this we're going to discard because we've got new ones so we can set those aside. Yeesh. And the rest of this we just basically clean up. Now I'm looking at this screen and it it doesn't seem to have any debris or anything in it but it certainly has seen kind of better days. There's a the little bit here and a little bit there. So we'll go ahead and clean it up. It's important to use the screen to sort of diagnose any issues with the engine. If there's any contaminants in the screen or lots of them, that can tell you there's something going wrong with your engine. Take care not to bend this flange. This thing is aluminum and it's, it's pretty soft and pretty flimsy. So be careful with it. All right, we'll set that aside over here. Now take a look at your drain pan little guy here as well, this plate. And there are some little bits of something on here. I don't know what this is, but it's not metallic. It feels rubbery or something. So that's one thing. And then sort of paw around in it a little bit, run your finger around. What you're feeling for is, um, some types of chunks and things. So I don't know if you can see, it's a little silvery here, which I guess that's normal engine wear, at least we're kind of hoping it is. Um, so we'll just clean that up, but just keep that in mind. So each time you do your oil change, you, what you're really looking for are major changes and major differences each time.
Now if your plate's been leaking on your car, there's probably a, a good chance that somebody has tried to push put those bolts on too tight, all six of them, and they've sort of mushroomed these different holes over here. And if that happens, it's very, very difficult to get this thing to not leak. So take a look at it and you might need to press them back down a little bit. Um, but if your plate wasn't leaking at all, I wouldn't fuss with it at all. It's, it's obviously good enough to seal. Want to make sure our, this surface here that that gasket's going to go over is nice and smooth as well. There aren't any nicks or burrs. If there are, you're going to have to run them down with a, a fine file. You just need a very smooth surface. I'm just inspecting the plate to make sure it looks okay. It's got a bad nick on one side. That's obviously nothing to do with the ceiling, but um, it could. You can look at it and see if you see any damage. Now I do see these up a little bit, uh, most of these, but the plate wasn't leaking on the car too bad, so I'm probably not going to fuss with it. We can clean out our screen with a little bit of brake cleaner. Gasoline or petrol will also work. Hmm. I think these little bits of Plastic or rubber I'm seeing are probably silicone from something inside the engine would be my guess. Now as this plate goes back up, there's a center tube that comes down from the engine and goes into the center of this. So we just want to make sure that it's straight and level and in, it, in the right spot for it to accept that tube. Now to put on our two new paper gaskets, one goes on the plate, then the strainer, and then the other one goes on top of it like that. We're going to put a thin coat of grease all the way around them so that they have a better chance of actually sealing. They're pretty delicate, so be careful with them. Okay, yay. We'll set this guy down. Lining up the holes, of course. Like that. Do our next, next gasket here, the top one. Okay, and we just set our gasket on top here. There we go. Okay. Now our screen and plates ready to go back on the car. Our oil is pretty much stop dripping so just a little teeny bit so we're going to hide and clean it up and reinstall our plate and our screen all right here's the assembly we can hold it up with one of our nuts here just so it doesn't fall back out again Okay, now we have a new set of copper washers for each one of these as well. It came in our little kit. So we're going to fit a copper washer and then our nut on each one of the studs. We can pull off the very first one we put on and go ahead and put a washer under that. Okay. And all of those up, we're going to tighten them in a cross pattern just a little bit at a time, or a star pattern, I suppose. Now, this one. Now, the final torque spec on this is only five foot pounds, so we don't want to put these in very tight at all. This one. There we go, five foot pounds. And Five foot-pounds. All right, that should be it. There's five foot-pounds. There we go, five foot-pounds all around.
We're all set with our 17 millimeter hex here for the drain plug on the bottom. But before we pull this plug loose, we want to make sure that we can put the we can pull the filler plug on the side first. The last thing we want to do is drain all the fluid out of the transmission just to find out that we can't <laughs> put it back in. So step one, remove the one on the side. It'll also help this drain a little bit as well because it'll allow a little bit of air into the system. So this guy comes up here, fits in here. There we go. It's loosening up, which is a great sign. Okay, great. Now for the plug on the bottom, go ahead and loosen it up and then we'll move our tray into position. Wow, that's in tight. Okay, we can take our plug out the rest of the way and go ahead and drain this. There we go. Ew, boy, that's pretty dark. We'll let that drain for a bit. While the last little bit is draining, I'm gonna go ahead and clean this drain plug that was on the bottom. Now it's magnetic and it looks like it's picked up a bit of stuff here. I imagine this is probably the end of, I don't know what, what it is actually. It might be parts of the synchros. I thought they were made out of copper, but I don't know. But at any rate, there is a decent amount of fuzz in the bottom of this thing. There's no chunks, which is good, but there is some fuzz. So we're gonna go ahead and clean it out. Something to keep an eye on. The transmission oil on these cars should probably be changed every other year. And it's a good idea to sort of get a, a baseline and say, okay, after a year I see this much, or two years I see this much, and then uh, look for any real major changes. Well, that's been draining for a bit, and I don't think there's a whole lot more fluid that's gonna come out. I've cleaned our drain plug. It was a bit of a mess. Um, I used a bit of brake cleaner and such to get it out, but I used some compressed air as well to blow some of the filings off there. A little hard to get off, actually, off the magnet. So we're all set to put this back in. I think we're down to just the last little dribbles. So we've got our plug all cleaned, and we're ready to put it back in. Just clean this up a little bit. Go ahead and thread it in. Now the torque value on this is just 15 foot-pounds. It's not a lot. And run this up. There we go. So that's all set. Next, all we have to do is refill the transmission. And so the fluid just goes in the uh, hole on the side that we took the plug out of. We're gonna fill it up until it just so ever slightly dribbles out a little bit. Now it can be a little hard to get the fluid up there. It's kind of cramped up in there. So um, you can buy from uh, your auto parts store just a simple pump and it, it actually screws onto the top of the oil bottles. So it makes it pretty easy. There's a, you have to pump for quite a few times to get it all out, but it's a lot easier than just trying to squeeze it and trying to get it in that little hole. So, feed our hose up into the hole in the transmission there. Looks like it's going to stay. So then we just start pumping, and we keep pumping until the fluid just ever so slightly dribbles out. Now the capacity on this is a little over about two and a half quarts or so, 2.4, something like that. So we'll run through two and a half of these bottles or so. So this is our last bottle, but we're not gonna put the whole thing in. And so what you wanna do is you wanna kinda of pay attention as you're filling it the last, this last little bit. And as it starts to dribble out the side, you'll know you're done. You probably wanna be ready with your drain plug and go ahead and start to put that in right as you see it dribbling out a little bit. All right, I think I see it starting to come out a little bit. Yep. Okay, I think we're there. And that makes sense. We're halfway down on our bottle, so two and a half quarts was just about perfect. We have the fluid just barely dribbling out of the hole, so we know we're full. Next, we just replace our fill plug and torque it down to the same 14 foot-pounds as the plug that's on the bottom of the transmission. 
All right, so we just need our drain plug in. Okay, there we go, 14 foot-pounds. With the transmission fluid all filled, next we're gonna go ahead and put in the engine oil. To fill the oil, it's probably easiest just to remove the air cleaner. We need to remove it anyways because we need to go ahead and clean it as well. This is one of the original oil bath air cleaners, so we're gonna go and clean this as well. So just need to remove this vent tube here. There we go. And the air cleaner is held on with a 10 millimeter clamp bolt right below the base here. So we're gonna use a 10 millimeter nut driver to pull it off. All right, just needs to be loose. Go ahead and work this little guy off. There we go, just set it aside. You wanna be really careful when you take it off. Remember, it is filled with oil and if you set it on its side, it'll, that, all that oil will go ahead and leak out. Now this car has its original oil bath air cleaner. How cool is that? So let's go ahead and take this apart and clean it out and get it all set and ready to go. Now there's four snaps on this. You just raise them up, two on each side, two in the back here. And this center section will pull out. Now you wanna support this thing because it does have oil in it and it will go all over your lap if you're not careful. So as we pull this up, let's see if we can set this aside over here. This is a bit of a mess. And so this is our oil bath inside here and there's, it's yucky and kind of terrible. So we're going to go ahead and pour this oil out and clean this entire base. With our bottom part all clean, we can just sort of set it aside for now and get started on the top. So this top part has what looks like a bunch of coarse horse hair in it. So we're gonna try and clean that out as best we can. Also the, uh, the bottom of this piece here has a bunch of schmutz on it as well. So we're just gonna clean the best we can, maybe get some solvent up in there and try to get out as much dirt as possible. Now, depending what kind of solvent you've used to clean this, you want it to be dry before we put this all back together again. We don't want solvent thinning out the oil in the oil bath. With both halves of this completely clean, all that we have to do now is go ahead and fill it back up with oil and put our top back on and snap it in place. So we're gonna, there's a little arrow inside here that tells you how far to fill it up. It's really about three quarters of an inch off the bottom. Now we just fill it with the regular engine oil, the same engine oil we put in the car works great. So they give you a nice little arrow here and tell you to fill right to about that point. So you can see we've, we've filled up our oil bath and we're all set to put it back together. So when you put your top back on, it only goes one way. If you get it out 180 degrees, it obviously won't line up. All right, go. Okay, now we're all ready to put it back on the car. Okay, with all this open, it's easy enough to get funnel here. Great. We're gonna be adding probably two and a half quarts of oil, I think. We're gonna start by pulling our dipstick and make sure it's nice and clean. So we can get an accurate reading as we're doing this. Just clean it off, put it right back. All right. We'll just go ahead and add our first two quarts of oil. At two quarts, we'll go ahead and check our dipstick. 
<laughs> we've got just the teeniest little bit at the bottom. As you're coming close to the halfway mark on your third bottle, make sure you check your dipstick. We don't want to overfill. Our dipstick's at the halfway mark here. They're actually pretty easy to read. So right there at the halfway mark between this notch and this notch here. So I'm gonna add a little bit more and call it good. All right, so we're right just, just a hair shy from the top mark. That's a great place to be. We didn't overfill it, but we're right very close to this top mark. Beetles don't have all that much oil in them, so I try to get it as close to the mark as possible without going over. So that looks awesome to me, it's perfect. All right, and just replace our filler cap. Okay, so that's the engine oil. So normally at this point, we go ahead and pull the distributor off the car. There's a little bolt in the back here that we can take off that's attached to this plate and slide the entire distributor up, take it to the bench, and replace the points. And then we'd go ahead and gap them to 0 0.016 inches. But this car has an aftermarket 009 distributor on it. And with that, it also has a set of Surefire VW1 electronic ignition in it. And that eliminates the points in this distributor completely. So we can't set the point gap because there's no points to set. So it also means that our timing is going to stay a little more consistent on the car. Because once you set your points, you have to then, you must go back and reset your timing because your timing is based on the point gap. So the electronic ignition gives us a consistent point gap all the time and, and no moving parts. So we don't have to fuss with that. So that's great. But at this point, I do want to go in and check the static timing on this distributor as a baseline. Because I'm pretty certain we're going to have to adjust it a little bit, but I just want to see where it is before we start. Now, I have a tack dwell meter that I use for this, but you can just as easily do this with a simple timing light. You just need something with a, with a light bulb in it, really, is all you need. So on your meter or your light, you know, one of your wires is going to go to the negative terminal on the coil, that's usually the wire, the only wire coming out of your distributor. Now in this case, because it has this electronic points thing on it, it has a it has a wire going to each side of the coil, but one of them is black. And generally on the coil, the negative side only has one thing attached to it. It's usually the wire goes down to the distributor. So we're going to attach there. All right, to the negative side. The other wire just goes to a good ground. So let's see, I think we can just attach it here to the, this little arm on the carburetor. That should work. Okay, next step is to go ahead and turn the ignition on. Of course, do not try to start the car. You're just turning the ignition on. Now, it's very important when you do this, when you check the timing on your car, that you have your distributor cap off. That's very important because once you turn the ignition on, the car's live, and you could turn the engine over, and it could actually fire on a cylinder. So we do not want that to happen. So that's why we've taken our, we still have our distributed cap off. Our rotor is telling us that we're very close to cylinder number one, top dead center. I'm looking on our pulley, and I can see that the timing marks are to the left a little bit, which is just where we want to be. What we're going to do is rotate the engine a bit until our meter comes up. Just looking for the point in which the meter turns on. There it goes. Back it up a little bit. So it turns off again. Go forward. There it is. So it looks like the car is timed a little hot, actually. Um, the far notch, the notch on the far left of the pulley here, is the top dead center mark. Then we have, I believe this is seven and a half and then this is 10, you want to line up with the crack that's in the case, the split in the case. It's on the right side of this flange that sticks out. So that's right here. So it looks like this car is timed pretty hot, almost probably 13 degrees before top dead center. It seems a bit, a bit hot. 
But I wanted to check that and double check that because if that's where we end up and that's where we were, then I'll feel better about it. But if, um, if we go ahead and go through this whole timing process and I'm not super, super happy with it, I'll know that this car wasn't timed properly to start with. We're going to go ahead and remove our meter. The next step is to get the car running and warm it up a little bit so that we can time it with the uh, timing gun dynamically. Since the distributor on this car is the 009 distributor and it also has electronic points in it, I'm a little fuzzy as to where to time this thing statically. So we're going to go ahead and check it dynamically and see where it is. It should be about 32 degrees of advancement at about 3000 RPM or so. And since I've already checked it statically and the numbers were pretty high, uh, well past 10, maybe closer to 14, that I think it's timed a little bit too hot. So what the, uh, this timing light is pretty cool though. It has uh, an adjustment on the back of it. And what that allows us to do is we can set this to whatever advancement we think it's supposed to be, say 32 degrees, and then we can fire it at the pulley down there and the notch in the pulley, the top dead center notch, should line up with the, with the mark on the case. That's what this is, that's why this switch is so neat. Otherwise what we'd have to do would be make a second mark on the pulley at 32 and then time off that mark. But I think this is going to be quite a bit easier. This is pretty cool. So it comes, it, it's pretty easy to hook up. It just has power and ground on it and then it has uh, an inductive clamp that goes over the spark plug wire for number one. I also have my dwell and tack meter set up so we'll get an idea of what our RPMs actually are on this car. So I'll go through how I'm going to hook all this stuff up. We'll go ahead and start the car, check it at idle and see where we are again. Then we'll go ahead and put a spacer behind the throttle and, and open it up a bit get it up to about 3000 RPM and then we'll check the timing again, see where we are. And if we need to adjust it, it's pretty simple. All we need to do is loosen up the little 10 millimeter nut that's at the base of the clamp and the distributor and we just rotate the distributor to get it to where we need it to be. Now since the engine's going to be running, I have my hair pulled up a little bit in the back. I don't want anything falling into the moving bits on the engine. To hook up our dynamic timing light, we need power and ground. A good place for power is the uh, plus terminal here on the generator. That'll work great. That'll give us plenty of power. The negative, we can go ahead and hook it back here on the clamp bolt on the back of the generator as well. That gets our wires off to the right side of the car a little bit and out of the way. For our inductive clamp, it just goes over spark plug number one. Slide this little lever back on it and then just put it over spark plug number one and that's it. Now I'm not going to hook it to the back of my timing light until the car is actually running. I don't want any uh, any impulses in the electrical system to cause any problems with the timing light. For our tack and dwell meter we're going to set it up the same way we did to check the timing statically on the car. All right so we're hooking that to our negative wire on the coil here. So we got a good connection there. Okay, great. Sometimes, yep, yeah, these wires on the, that hold the coil on are actually really good as well. That gets the wire for my tack and dwell meter out of the way as well. The next step is just to start the car and see where we are. Okay, we've got our engine running. It's always best to do this when the engine is warm so it's running as consistently as possible. You can read the idle and get some idea of what it is on our tack dwell meter. It's the eighth cylinder scale, but we just double the values. So to start off, we're going to put the timing light on zero so that it, it will read top dead center with no advancement. Let's go ahead and roll it up to 3000 RPM and see where we are. All right, at 3000 RPM. Okay, that seems a bit crazy to me. 40 degrees is just too much. So we're going to 
loosen the nut uh, that holds the clamp on the distributor. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna try and get the, at 3000 RPM, we're gonna rotate the distributor until we only have 32 degrees of advancement. All right, so we loosen our little nut here. It just needs to be loose enough so that we can adjust it. We're gonna set our little rotary switch on the back here to 32, because that's what we want for degrees of advancement. We're gonna kick the engine back up to 3,000. We're gonna rotate the distributor until the, the white line marks or lines up with the, with the crack in the case. So that's top dead center lines up. can shut down the car and tighten the 10 millimeter nut on the distributor. All right, we just disconnect all of our timing light wires and our tack wires. And we don't want to forget to tighten this little nut on the distributor now that we have it exactly where we want it. Well, the whole point of this really was to know what our maximum advance is on the distributor and also to know what our advance is at idle so that in the future we don't have to go through all this fuss of trying to do this with a timing light and all that. If you want to be able to time this engine statically in the future, all you need to do is go back to the whole static timing procedure and now that the distributor is where it needs to be, you rotate until a little light comes on and then you want to mark that point and where it lines up with the crack in the case and that becomes your new static timing mark. So I've got the engine just before top dead center a bit. I have my my tack dwell meter set to volts and it's all hooked up and ready to go. And then uh, I also have the ignition on and I of course have my distributor off. You always want this distributor cover off while you're doing this. All right, so we just rotate forward until there we go. All right, rotate back. Rotate up until we see the meter come up. There it goes. And then back a little bit. Click. All right, there we go. Well, it just so happens that it looks like it's at the, the uh, 10 degree mark. So we'll put the teeniest bit of white paint on that so we know where that goes in the future. There we go. So our timing mark is now at 10 degrees before top dead center for this particular distributor. With our new mark on the pulley, we know exactly where to time the engine statically now, so that'll make life a lot easier in the future. You won't have to use the timing light and all that fuss. Now with the engine timed properly at this point, the last thing we need to do is to adjust the carburetor. So we're going to put the air cleaner back on because the engine sort of is expecting that air cleaner to be on there. And then we're going to go through the process and the procedure to, to, to set up the carburetor so that it idles at the right place and that uh, the mixture is where it needs to be. Okay, super simple to refit the air cleaner. We just set it on top of the carburetor. Just line it up a little bit. The clamp bolt on it is a 10 millimeter, so I'm going to use my 10 millimeter nut driver. Make sure it's straight. All right. And then we're gonna hook our crankcase breather tube back up. With the air cleaner back on, we're gonna start the engine, get it warm again so that we can tune the carburetor. Before we tune the carburetors, we wanna make sure the car is warm. And more importantly, that the fast idle screw here on the end of the throttle arm is sitting on the very bottom of the cam. So there's a little cam, a step cam here that works with the choke and we want to make sure that that's sitting all the way down at the bottom and not sitting up on one of those steps. 
Now that our car is good and warm, we go ahead and turn it off because we need to set some sort of base adjustments on the on um, all of our adjustments here. This carburetor is a Solex 31 PICT, I believe. So it has two adjustments on the side of it. You're going to find all manner of different carburetors on these cars. So most importantly, go to the manual for the carburetor that you have on the car and adjust it accordingly. But this is going to be for this particular carburetor, which is a pretty common carburetor on these things. So this little screw on the back of the throttle arm here is not to adjust the idle. There's a different adjustment for the idle down below, but this is, this is just a stop here so that it can ride up on the cam when the car is cold. So the way we set this screw is we run it in until it touches the cam and then back it off just a little bit and then back and right as it just sort of kisses the cam, then we go ahead and turn it one more quarter and that's going to open up our butterfly the .004 inch that it needs to be. We now start the car again, warm it back up and make sure that the, the fast idle screw is sitting on the bottom of the cam again and we're going to go ahead and adjust the idle next. I've hooked up my dwell tack meter here as well so I can see pretty much where we are with the idle. Now you read the double, you double the eight cylinder scale on this and it's reading about four, so we're close to 800, so a little bit low. So to adjust the idle, the idle adjustment is actually the big screw that's just up and to the left a little bit of the teeny little screw we were the volume control screw. So we're making sure that we're on the bottom cam here, the very bottom of the uh, choke cam as well. So there's nothing messing anything up. All right, the right lowers the idle, loosening it raises the idle. There we go, bringing it out. We're looking for an idle of about 850. All right. Now we've loosened that screw and it gives us an idle of about 850. Let's go ahead and goose it a bit, and make sure it settles down where it should. Okay, we've got our idle somewhere between 850 and 900-ish, something like that. Yep, and it's settling right back down nicely. Okay, so that's great. Next, what we do is go back to our little, the little bitty screw, the little volume control screw, and we're gonna roll that back and forth until we get the best idle and it sounds the smoothest. And we're gonna open it up a little bit until it falters and close it down a little until it falters and we're gonna move it open again until it feels great and it's just sort of towards the high side of that range. There we go, you can hear the idle coming up. It sounds a lot smoother. Yeah, that sounds better. We continue running this in. There, it's starting to falter again. All right, now we start opening up. You can hear it being very lean. Okay, we open it back up again until it runs better. There we go. I'm loosening it now until we find the other the other edge. All right, I think it's starting to falter a little bit again. Yep, a little bit. We're gonna roll it back in a little bit. Okay. That sounds a lot better actually. Now looking at our idle, it's gone up a little bit, so I'm going to lower the idle just a tad again. Once again, that's the big screw at the top. Sounds 
like a great spot for the idle. Okay, that sounds great to me. The idle is good and solid. It's a, maybe a hair fast, but I think uh, certainly at our altitude, it just helps the car pull away a little bit better as well. And we're all tuned. So next step would be just to sort of take the car out and drive it around a little bit and see how it runs. With our carburetor all tuned and the engine running great, the last thing on our checklist is to grease the front end. Since this is a 1969, it has a ball link front end on it, so there's really nothing we can grease up here. None of these components here really have any place to put grease. I have no grease circs on them. Not even the tie rod end does. So we really only have four places we can grease and that's the two torsion bars and on each side. So four total. Now, if you have an older car that has the kingpin and all that, there's grease circs on those and you wanna get the wheels off the ground, loosen up the kingpins, shoot them with grease and then tighten it all back up. The R356 has that type of front end because it's a 1958 and I'll be doing a video on the full greasing of that car. So that would be a video to check out if you have an older car. But for this one, all we're going to do is go ahead and grease our torsion tubes here. We have four grease circs we're going to hit on the torsion tubes. There's one here on the left side and one down at the bottom. And then same sort of thing on this side. We have one up here and we have one down here. Before we hit our grease circs up here, we wanna make sure that they're good and clean. So we're gonna take a rag and we're gonna clean each one of them off before we start. The last thing we wanna do is take all the dirt that's around them and push that into the torsion tubes. Start with our two over here and get them nice and clean. You may need to use a little bit of cleaner here to get these things nice and clean. Depends on how dirty they are. They're usually kind of a mess. All right, and we'll clean our top one up here as well. With the grease circs cleaned, the next thing is to use our grease gun. We're gonna fit them over the grease circs here, and we're gonna squeeze and squeeze until we see the grease start to come out of the seals on the end of the torsion tube. Now we wanna continue a little bit after that and get a little bit of grease out because there's always gonna be a bit of dirt and stuff around there, so we wanna kinda of push that through. And then we'll go ahead and remove that excess grease when we're done. So we insert the end of our grease gun sort of at an angle and work it towards the center and it should pop in and stay on. All right, now we just squeeze away until we see grease come out. We're gonna be looking over here for grease to squirt out a little bit. All right, I think you'd be surprised at how many Sometimes you have to pump the grease gun to get grease to come out. So we see a bit of it coming out. It's black and schmutzy, so we're gonna push a little bit out just to get any of that crummy grease out. All right, I'm gonna catch it with our rag. It does make a bit of a mess. All right. You just wanna clean this up a bit. You don't want all that extra grease out there. All right, we can pop our grease circ off by just sort of pulling it down a little bit and it'll pop right off. Remember to clean this off. We don't want uh, the zerk to be all dirty and, and attract a bunch of dirt. Come back with your rag and clean things a bit more here. All right, with the bottom one filled, we go ahead and do the top one just after that. Put it in at an angle and then sort of rotate it straight out. It is amazing how much grease these things will take. Okay, I see some coming out. That's perfect, great. 
and put a rag up there to catch any. Pushing a bit out. Get any of that yucky grease right at the end out. All right, looks pretty good. We just rotate it off. Our grease gun off the zip. Clean that up as well. The other two grease circs on this side of the car are exactly the same as this. We go through the same process. So we'll go ahead and hook up our grease gun, squirt until we get a little bit of grease out and then clean up the mess and then we're done. That's about it for the front of this car because it has a ball link suspension. We don't have the king pins. We don't have any of that to grease. And I looked at the tie rod ends as well and they don't have grease circs as e either. So there's really no other maintenance grease wise we can do on the front bits up here. So that's pretty much it for greasing underneath this car. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. If you got any questions or comments, go ahead and leave them down below. And welcome again to all of our new friends in Brazil. And Marcelo, thank you so much for the shout out on your channel. If you really enjoyed this video, go ahead and share it with your friends. That would be super awesome. You can also find us on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook as well. So thank you so, so much for watching. And until next time, safe travels. Bye.